Well, Edward Kasner was born in 1878, went on to be one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, one of the most prominent, and, uh, prominent Americans studying in the field of math. In 1940, he co-authored a book called Mathematics and the Imagination, in which he told a story of how he asked his nine-year-old nephew to give a name to an enormous number. The number was one to the power of 100, or one followed by 100 zeros. The boy came up with this name, Gugal. Kastner introduced it into mathematic theory in that year. And more than 50 years later, Larry Page and Sergey Brin needed a name for their upstart company. You see, Brin had a bold, if not radical, idea of finding a way to organize the seemingly infinite amount of information that was contained on the internet. And Larry Page, of course, had been fascinated with this idea of an infinite yet finite number, one to the power of a hundred. And as legend has it, it was through a play on words or maybe even a spelling mistake that this became the name of their company. We know it now as the largest search engine in the world, maybe the most recognized name on the internet. Christians rest their faith on another name, the name of Jesus. And that name is the most famous name on earth. Google itself reports that there are almost 25 million searches for the name of Jesus each month, vastly more than any other name. Google also claims that of the 130 million books that have been written and bound in human history that are still surviving to this day, an estimated 40% are on or about the topic of Jesus. I want to propose to you this morning that bold, even radical commitment to the name of Jesus is at the center of the growing church, our growing church city center, and a bold, if not radical, commitment to the person of Jesus is what has always been required in order for the church to flourish. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, and I want to read for you this morning from verses 1 to 22. It's a little bit of a lengthy passage, but it, it tells a unified story. picking up the narrative of the life of the early church, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 22. And this is God's word to us. As they were speaking to the people, this is Peter and John. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. With Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition 
But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For a notable sign that has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anybody in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Last week, we began a series on building the body, trying to understand the building of the church and the building up of believers in the church. We started with the scene that is most often credited as Jesus' institution of the New Testament church, where Peter, speaking on behalf of the disciples, confesses the true identity of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. You remember that last week we were in Matthew chapter 16. And Jesus says in verse 18, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. And we learn that Jesus intended to use these building materials, these apostles who were confessing his truth and his identity. Peter the first, because they held this true confession of faith, it made them useful stones in the building material of the first century church. So today, we are fast-forwarding now as we see this church beginning to take shape. Some things happened in between there, right? The disciples had to see a little bit more. The church is instituted, but a number of, of, of events happen, most notably the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. And now, we're in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 picks up with the ascension of Jesus, and his disciples replace Judas the traitor. They're getting organized for what's about to come. Then Acts chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit comes, just as Jesus promised on the day of Pentecost, which turns into the launch pad for the disciples going out from Jerusalem to begin the building process. Then in Acts chapter 3, we have a powerful event. A lame man is restored to full capacity by Peter and John. And then Peter comes with a powerful sermon to the people explaining what has just happened. <clears throat> Excuse me. That brings us to Acts chapter 4. And we are right in the middle of the first phase of church growth. The context in, in that day is that people are being added to the number of Christians day by day. Acts chapter 2 tells us that. The community itself is devoted to the teaching of the apostles and fellowship and prayer. And meeting the needs of those who comprise it and selling what they have so that they can make sure to sustain themselves. And here, as chapter 4 breaks out, we see another 5,000 people have come to believe in the message about Jesus. They are poised for growth. They are in the midst of growing. And as I said, the main idea I want to leave with you this morning is that a radical understanding of Jesus and a radical commitment to the name of Jesus is at the center of the growing church. But I also want to ask our church, are we ready for this kind of growth? Are we ready for this kind of church? See, I understand that our context is different in many ways, but I also understand the underlying spiritual principle for how and why the church of Christ experiences growth applies across the centuries because Jesus is still asking for a radical commitment today. Not a fanatical commitment, but a radical commitment. So we need to see what it takes to follow him, to grow in him, to grow with each other as his church. Let's start the journey together. The first thing I want you to notice from this story in Acts chapter 4 is that the church grows when it is offensive. The church grows when it is offensive. Now, by offensive, I don't mean rude. I don't mean unkind. I don't mean malicious. 
But as we read what starts to happen, as the church is taking hold and the apostles are ministering and preaching, we quite clearly see that some noses are getting bent out of shape. We see right off the bat in verse 2, we have the priests, we have the captain of the temple, and we have the Sadducees. The captain of the temple was probably the priest second in rank to the high priest, also responsible for the security of the temple. It's like the, the temple police, so to speak. And then we have the Sadducees coming along with them. We've heard about them before. You know that the Sadducees were more of a political body with religious support and affiliation from the priesthood. The point is that there was arousal from religious and political and social angles all directed towards what the apostles were doing. There were people in vocational ministry, people in lay leadership. The message of the apostles was causing multiple elements to rally against them. Because as we see in verse 2, they were greatly annoyed. They're so annoyed that they had Peter and John arrested. That's That's pretty upset. And Luke, writing to us in the book of Acts, juxtaposes this fact with the fact that there were 5,000 who came to faith that day because of their preaching. See, the church grows when it is offensive because the message of the gospel is a disruption to people's lives. In this case, the disruption stems from the fact that the Sadducees denied the resurrection of the body. They denied the resurrection of the dead. You know that they challenged Jesus, right? The whole force of the apostles' teaching is about Jesus, that they had seen him after the resurrection, that he'd been raised by the power of God for the forgiveness of sins and victory over the true enemy, not the Romans, but death. There's lots of reasons why the gospel is offensive. Christianity denies materialism. It says that we are more than bodies. We are a dualism of body and soul. Our physical body and immaterial soul will survive, our our physical body joined with the immaterial soul makes us human beings. And our soul survives the expiration of this body and one day we'll receive a new body so we can be completely whole, made the way that God intends us to be. That idea is offensive to the materialist, to the physicalist who says that matter is all that there is. Anything you experience that seems like a soul is really just the interaction of of chemicals in your brain or the particular pattern of electrical activity in your neurons. Christianity is offensive because it's the only world religion in which God himself becomes the sacrifice to bring salvation. That idea is offensive to many. It's offensive to, to Muslim teaching, for example. Christianity denies the pantheon of gods and rests in the fact that there is one God alone and he alone is worthy of worship and praise and exaltation. That is offensive to the religious pluralist, to many forms of Hinduism. Christianity insists that the nature of human beings is desperately wicked and depraved, that we can do absolutely nothing to improve ourselves, to save ourselves. That idea is offensive to the humanist, probably to the Buddhist as well, on the path to enlightenment. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that the message of the cross is foolishness to the world. Galatians 5 says that the cross is an offense to the proud and the entitled. But the real question this morning is, are we willing to be offensive for the gospel? That's a tough question. Are we willing to have an uncomfortable conversation for the sake of Jesus? Are we willing to be disagreed with, confronted, imprisoned? See, I'm not talking about being rude or hateful or belligerent. Peter is going to say in his first epistle that we must always be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have, but do it with gentleness and respect. Paul told the Colossians to make sure their words were seasoned with salt so they could be poignant and incisive, yet full of grace. Speak the truth in love is what he told the Ephesians, but you do need to speak the truth. And you do need to know that when you 
speak the truth, not everyone will be happy. In fact, the church can only grow when it is offensive to the prevailing mood and doctrines of the culture, precisely because only then will it be proclaiming the truth about who Jesus is. Who Jesus is and why he died. What that says about you and what that says about me. That message is both counterintuitive and countercultural. It's offensive to say that people shouldn't be able to do whatever they want as long as they don't infringe on someone else's freedom, as if that were even possible. It's offensive to say that your nature is inherently corrupt. It's offensive to say that I don't have it within me, the power within me, to save myself and lift myself up by my philosophical bootstraps. It's offensive to say that that you and I are sinners, but we are. Is our church willing to be offensive? If not, it's going to be hard to grow because it's going to be hard to be true to the gospel. I remember what it was like in my first year of secular university. I don't know if there's a more secular place than downtown Montreal on a university campus. You know, I actually found it easier uh, to talk about being a Christian in university than in, in high school because high school is driven very much by peer pressure. And in the university, diversity is, is valued. So really, you can say whatever you want, talk about whatever you want, as long as you don't infringe upon anybody else. This is, this is freedom. Well, before long, I did infringe on some other people's freedom by holding ideas that were offensive. It came as a great surprise to me, but I remember getting into arguments with one of my good friends who could not understand why I would identify first as a Christian before I did as a visible minority. Why my race would be less of an identifying characteristic to me, especially when you're in a, when you're in a minority, than being a Christian. So we debated that a lot. They couldn't understand me. I couldn't understand them. But the gospel is an offense. That was relatively easy. The debate we face today as a church is much more difficult. So to stand on the gospel today in the arena of our church, postmodern, post-Christian, it's getting harder and harder. Are we willing to be offensive for the sake of the gospel? Are we willing to tell the whole city of Mississauga that we want to build an expansion or we want to buy a 10-acre piece of land or we want to erect another building or a parking lot so that we can stand on the roof and shout the gospel from the rooftops? The church grows when it's offensive. The church also grows in the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the church grows in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we speak about the gospel, we're not speaking on our own. This is to our great advantage. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to his disciples, and we would never have gotten to this point in the book of Acts had he not sent the Spirit to fill and equip those men in Acts chapter 2. You can see this so clearly in the text, because when the council came to question the men the following day, After spending the night in prison, they questioned Peter and John. And Peter responded to them with more than they bargained for. But that incredible sermon came because he was filled with the Spirit. The text says it. Verse 8 says, Peter, filled with the Spirit, spoke to them. (coughs) Excuse me. Have you ever been in a situation where you were called upon to witness for Christ? as a surprise to you, taken off guard, someone just walks up to you at your work and says, so I hear you go to church. Why do you do that? Maybe they say, you're a Christian, right? Can you tell me why God let my, let my mom get cancer? You feel a lump well up in your, in your throat. Your eyes kind of start darting around looking for an exit. This kind of can catch you by surprise. But I would venture to say that an equal number of us have also felt that supernatural experience of words coming out of our mouth with what seems like no conscious effort at all, words of comfort, words of grace, words of truth, words about Jesus and the difference he's made to you, words inviting a friend to come to church or maybe to a musical or to an Easter celebration. I would bet that many of you could tell stories 
of courage you never thought you had that emerged when you just opened your mouth and let the Holy Spirit speak through you. I know you could. See, Jesus didn't just commission us to make disciples and then leave us to our own devices. He didn't just send us off a cliff and hold on to the parachute for us. He said, I am with you always. And then he backed it up by sending the third person of the the Godhead, the spirit of truth, to minister to our spirit and lead us and help us and guide us and strengthen us for what lies ahead. Because the church grows in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus commanded them to wait, to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came. That's why Paul commands us to walk by the Spirit in Galatians 5, 16, and keep in step with the Spirit in Galatians 5, 25, because the church grows in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't grow as disciples if we don't heed the voice of the Spirit speaking to us. We can't grow as a church if his disciples here are not actively listening and obeying and being led by the Spirit, both individually and corporately. That's one of the ways that we know the direction God is leading by the ministry of the Spirit to individuals revealed to be consistent amongst the body when we share with each other what God is saying to us. And wow, that's affirming. That seems, that seems to be what God is really saying to our whole church. And that's why unity, not just unity, but unity in spirit was one of the characteristics of the early church. That's why they seem to be so in line with one another, so in harmony with one another, Their community seemed to be be so peaceful and loving. And that's why we have it right there on our vision statement, to be spirit-filled and unified. Because the church grows in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will lead us forward where we need to go in the gospel. And he will give each one of us the words to say when we're standing for him in the arena. He will do it. He has promised that he will. The church grows when it is being offensive, The church grows in the power of the Holy Spirit, but the church also grows as it is challenged. The church grows as it is challenged. Certainly, one of the major characteristics of this passage is challenge. Despite the fact that the priests say, well, we we can't do anything to oppose them, they're opposing them the entire time that they're with them. You'll notice that it starts in verse 2 when they're annoyed. They're so annoyed that they throw them in jail in verse 3. Then they call them before a grand council to intimidate them in verse 5. Then they question them in verse 7. Then they conspire against them when they realize that they've lost the upper hand after Peter's speech, verse 16. Then they charge them to keep quiet in verse 18. When that backfires, they proceed to threaten them some more even as they're walking out the door. And in all of this, Peter and John, strengthened by the Spirit, don't give in. And the opposition didn't get any lighter after this incident. The story of Acts unfolds, and what do you have happen next? Stephen is stoned. You have a guy named Saul who's dragging Christians, kicking and screaming out of their homes and throwing them in prison. Then he converts to Christianity, and he starts getting thrown into prison and persecuted for the name of Christ. And Christians are attacked and marginalized and exiled and executed. And all the while... The church grows and adds to their number. Luke tells us in many cases it is precisely because the believers were scattered about in the face of persecution that they were able to spread the gospel to different corners of the region. And then in the next century, and in the one after that, the church takes hold and begins to expand, and its reach broadens while facing various different forms of intolerance and acceptance and rejection and condemnation and and persecution by the ruling authorities. We could talk for hours about opposition to the church. We don't have time to do that. But you see, the church, as it grows, as it's challenged, because opposition unites us. Opposition unites us. Opposition requires us to lean on God, to lean on him for everything, because we know we could never... We could never make it on our own. Opposition makes us thankful. And opposition solidifies our commitment to the truth. Jesus said that we're blessed when we're persecuted because of his name. And Paul told told the Romans that suffering produces perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope. 
Do you notice that there is a building process involved there? The believer is built up through this process where opposition and persecution and, 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 and forces weigh down on him, but yet God uses it to create perseverance and endurance, and endurance strengthens character. And out of, out of a right character, we have the right hope, the hope of glory in him. That's why James could turn around in James chapter 1 and say that testing produces steadfastness. And steadfastness needs to, leads to the perfecting of your character and the completion of your development. It's a growth process. It's a building, it's a building process. And in all of this, in all of this, the church of Christ grows stronger. That's why Peter could turn around in his epistle, chapter 1, verses 6, and say this. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, your faith even more precious than that, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. See, the reaction to continuous opposition of the church is an uncompromising commitment to the name of Jesus. That's what happened to them. That's what needs to happen to us. As opposition grows stronger, more fierce, more targeted, more personal, as it moves from the television screen into your very living room, into our kids' textbooks, into our workplace policies, <clears throat> onto our very doorstep. The church grows when it is uncompromising in its commitment to Jesus. It's funny that the text tells us the leaders were annoyed by the preaching of the resurrection. Then when they questioned them about the healing of the lame man, they completely ignored the resurrection. But Peter doesn't back down. Peter doesn't back down. He says in, in verse 9, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man was healed, he turns it around. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified and who God raised, he is the reason you're really, you're really opposing us today. And he draws the comparison between you who crucified him, talking to the leaders, and God who raised him from the dead. Now, who do you think is more powerful? <laughs> he draws out the reality that you were the builders, talking to the priests and the Sadducees and the scribes. You were the builders who rejected Jesus. You were supposed to be building the kingdom of God. But you failed to recognize him and you've rejected him. And now, God is building a kingdom using us, the disciples, as his instruments. He says the man who is healed is proof of this because we're acting in Jesus' name. We're acting in Jesus' name. And then he uses a play on the word saved. He says in verse 12, there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we may be saved. Because the word for healed that was being used here is actually a broader word that includes being saved and being healed. And he's really saying that Jesus saved this man. He didn't just heal him because true salvation, true healing comes from no one else except by him. And guess what? We all need healing this morning. What do you need to be healed of? I know there's a lot of ailments. There's a lot of sickness various diseases of different kinds. There's also a lot of brokenness, a lot of tense relationships, a lot of fractured relationships. There's a lot of habitual sin. There's a lot of despair and hopelessness. There's a lot of us who think we don't deserve to be healed or even helped, let alone accepted by God. But I've got news for you. And Peter and John have news for you. And Jesus has news for you because he can heal every ailment, every brokenness, every disease of your heart or body this morning. 
but he wants to offer you the healing of his salvation that makes you truly whole. He wants to offer you life. I can't do that. You can't do that. Pastor Derek can't do that. Peter and John can't do that. Billy Graham can't do that. John MacArthur can't do that. Andy Stanley can't do that. The Pope can't do it. The Prime Minister can't do it. Only Jesus can offer salvation and healing and complete restoration of our soul. Only the name of Jesus can heal completely. He can do it and he will do it if you call on his name. Because everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter said it himself in Acts 2.21. Paul said it in Romans 10 verse 13. They were both quoting the prophet Joel in Joel 2.32. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus says, I will give you living water. I will make you whole. I will give you rest. I will give you life. And the church grows when it is uncompromising in its commitment to the one who said, I am he. His name is Jesus. Which brings us to the fifth point. We're moving quick now. The fifth point is that the church grows with the fuel of passion. How can you not be passionate when you, when, when you know what God has done and what Jesus can do? You see, the thing that disarmed the, the opposers in this conflict was not the miracle they performed. It was the boldness of Peter and John. This hinges on verse 13. Look at verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. They were annoyed by the, by the, uh, the, the, the healing and by the, by the words, but they were astonished when they saw their boldness. It wasn't their eloquence. It wasn't, it wasn't the words that Peter and John were using that astonished them. It was their boldness, their passion, the authority with which they spoke. The text says they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Why did they recognize these men as having been with Jesus? The text doesn't say explicitly. I wonder whether they saw in them the same thing they saw in Jesus, namely the authority, the very authority of God in what was spoken. Remember when Jesus began his ministry and he came to Nazareth and he went up to the temple and he, they gave him the scroll of Isaiah to read and Jesus read about the good news from the Lord and the captives being set free and healing, the blind receiving their sight and then he said, today, in you hearing this, the scripture is fulfilled. He proclaimed himself to be the fulfillment of that text. And then in Luke 21, when the people, when the people rose up early to go down to the temple to hear Jesus teaching. Why? Because he taught with authority and boldness. And remember in Matthew chapter 7, when the people were astonished at the teaching because he speaks with one who has authority, they said. The religious leaders saw the boldness of these common men. And I think they remembered how Jesus disarmed their every trick and trap and argument and snare that they set for him. Everything they threw his way, how he spoke with the very authority of God. And they said, these men have been with Jesus because of their boldness, their passion, and their commitment to his name. And it was in this environment that the church was growing and thriving. In the environment of passion, fueled by the authority of Jesus, who had entrusted that authority to the church. And I want to ask us this morning, I want to press us with the question, when we leave this place and go out for lunch, when we drive out of the parking lot and drive into the driveway in our neighborhood, when we walk out of the sanctuary doors and through the doors of our workplace tomorrow morning, will anybody say, wow, those people must have been with Jesus? Will anybody see our passion, our boldness, our confidence, and recognize the character of Jesus? Will anybody see our compassion, our love, our radical understanding of the world and say, those people must have been with Jesus. Because that's when the church grows. When the people of God, the building material of the church, are so identifiable, identifiable with him that the world is forced to take note. And the opposition is disarmed by the power of the character of Christ within us because it takes the very character of Jesus himself. We can't grow if we haven't been 
with Jesus. If we haven't been with him, we won't be recognized as passionate and bold. So we need to get with him. The good news is he's here. He's here this morning, waiting for us to draw close to him, drawing us to himself as we might be kicking and screaming to go, waiting for us to throw our burdens on him, to cast our cares on him, waiting for us to learn from him and to be like him, and the world will see, and the gospel will go forward, and the church will grow. I think that's pretty cool. I'm excited about that. But sixthly and lastly, we see from the narrative that the church grows because of what God has done. If you're careful, you can trace this through the entire text. The church is growing because of what God has done. And that's the reason that this whole, this whole dialogue comes in the context of this miracle that was performed. Because a miracle, you know, is a sign. God doesn't perform miracles just for the sake of doing that one thing at that one particular time. There was always a sign associated with it. It's always pointing to something. What is it pointing to here? In the end, it all came back to the reality of the sign that was standing right in front of them, right beside the men. A man has been healed after 40 years. And even the priests and Sadducees themselves says, what are we going to do? The guy is standing right here. They tried to silence the apostles. But that didn't work because Peter and John spoke up again because their passion couldn't be contained. They said, look, we can't be silent. We have to speak about what we've seen and heard. You decide whether it's right or wrong, but we're going to talk about this because God has done something incredible. It wasn't just healing the lame man. That was pointing to something far more incredible. It's pointing to Jesus. What we have seen and what we have heard is what God has done for us and he can do it for you. He has changed things. He has changed the world. And the healing of this man is only a pointer to what God has done in the world. The same thing he did to that lame body he is doing for the world if we call on the name of Jesus. God sent this Jesus into the world to walk with us to teach us, to shepherd us, then you crucified him to silence him. Just like you're trying to silence us right now, Peter and John said, you tried to silence him, but that didn't work either because God raised him up. He didn't stay in the grave. And dozens and dozens of people saw him. We just got finished seeing him rise into heaven in the ascension. We just got finished receiving the Holy Spirit from him, the counselor he promised to send. And he told us to go in his authority. He gave us the authority from the Father and said, go and spread my name and tell the world about me. And those men whose lives had literally been transformed by Jesus were preaching the power of of transformation because of what they had seen happen to them and around them. And the church was growing. And as a church family, we grow. We grow as disciples, we grow as a family, we grow as a church. Ultimately, we grow because we remember and proclaim what God has done in us. You see, the most powerful apologetic, the most powerful witness is not a logical argument or a philosophical position. You don't have to worry about getting into that conversation about why you go to church and defending the philosophy of Christianity. You just need to tell them what God has done for you. And as you go into the world and talk about the name of Jesus, it's not just words. It's the reality of what he's done in your life that meets people in their own place of need, in their own need for healing. And as they come into our assembly, it's not just a lecture or a seminar that burns the heart of the one that God is drawing to himself. It's the reality that he can change their life. That's the victory that we celebrate the great things he has done, the great battles he has won. And people come to him and transformation continues within their own life. And what happens to the church? It grows. It grows stronger. It grows broader. It grows deeper. Those very lives transformed become the stones that he can use to build the body. No other name brings that kind of transformation. No other name has this authority. 
No other name is the cornerstone of our faith. No other name offers this kind of healing. What's in a name? Everything. If the name is Jesus. So let's call on his name this morning. Will you pray with me? We call on you this morning, Jesus, our rock, our cornerstone, and invite you to use us. Holy Spirit, please fill this place. And Father, speak in your power, by the power of your word. I pray, Lord, that if there is one this morning who has not called on the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, you will draw them to yourself. Show them the magnificent healing and transformation that you bring and grow your church today, I pray in Jesus' name.